While refining her technical skills at Columbia University, it was the desert landscapes of North Africa that inspired Lisa's artistic vision. She recounts her incredible journey to China's rugged and desolate far west, giving rise to her photographic series, The Living Shrines of Uyghur China. Yeah, I'm sure, because I painted portraits all the time, that that influenced her. And in the beginning, when she started photography, she did portraits, but she goes, a hundred times further than I ever went. And you know, her stuff is, has a lot to do with intellectual thoughts. And she's just, uh, you know, I, she way surpassed me. My voice developed. So by the time I went to Columbia, my work had been, I never stopped making work. So like anything, you're practicing a medium. So my eye got better and better and more interesting, I think, and more my own. And when, by the time I was leaving or still at Columbia, uh, it became place that started, that changed. I left this country and I started to make work that looked different. And some of the work that I was making here began to look different, but the change of environment sparked I think the work to really kind of blossom. And it, I began traveling in North Africa. And that was the first trip that I took was in um, North Africa. And I kind of fell in love with the desert. And I fell in love with the desert landscape and the landscapes that I passed through um, in Morocco. So I went back the following year and I photographed again. And, um, and my work really began to change and it became more iconic. And I had set some guidelines for myself uh, where, again, I wanted the work to be about intimacy, but how would I do that in a country that wasn't my own? So I never, I tried never to just like take pictures of people, you know? And I found that as I would get to know people along the travel, that there would be a meal or there might, there might be something that would bring us together. And then they would ask me to photograph. And then I began photographing like only when asked. But it was still the landscape that kept kind of calling me. So what I began to do is create these portraits of landscapes. So instead of doing landscape photography, I began making these portraits of the landscape. And I think if, if we looked at my work that I made in Sinai in 2001, and then the work that I made, that I began to make in, um, in Western China in 2002, and going on, there's a very strong connection in the vision. What is it about those barren, desolate landscapes that speaks to you? Well, as I said, it was a spiritual journey for me. And uh, one thing is the quiet and the space. And as an artist, I need that just to work here. So in a sense, the desert landscape, there's this like silence, but it's almost like a deafening silence. And then your vision kind of begins to morph. And I just started seeing things so much more intensely. Um, and I, the light and when there is something in the landscape, it's so much more pronounced. Um, and the way that the landscape moves, even though it's still, but it does move if you think about it, because the sand is always shifting, but too slow for you to see it. So, I mean, it kind of just all came together. How did you forge these relationships with people you'd never met in a foreign country? A little bit of charades, a little bit of drawing, a little bit of laughter, a little bit of pantomime, a lot of food. <laughs> food and tea is a good way to meet people and communicate, maps. I, I, I mean, you know, in general, once you're somewhere else, um, you're interested in, in understanding another culture and how it's similar to you, ultimately and uh, getting past the difference because there's so much similarity that we really have. And uh, people are also interested in, in knowing you. Living in Manhattan has really um, helped her. You know, she's lived here for like at least, you know, 17, 20 years now. 
you just meet so many different types of people in Manhattan, and I think she took that to uh, China and Morocco and other places that she visited because um, she never judges anybody. She's always open to conversations with anyone. The friendliness and all I think she gets from me. My husband is much more reticent, and I'm ready to talk to anybody too and have conversations with anybody, and I think she got that from me. It brings us nicely to your adventures uh, in the Uyghur provinces. How did that come about? What was your inspiration for that series of photographs? I went to China because a friend of mine was producing a film uh, by Quentin Tarantino. Uh, the Kill Bill films were actually shot in Beijing. Um, they were meant to look like Japan, uh, but they were shot in Beijing. So my friends contacted me and said, we have a suite, we have an extra room, come to China, do your thing, you can do whatever you want. Um, so I thought it was like an incredible opportunity. And so I got a ticket for five weeks. I went to China. And when I got there, I read my guidebook and um, the, what, what I now know as the Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region is uh, home of the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, which is different than the Gobi Desert. And everything that I read about it, it's a, a Muslim community, predominantly Sufi, so they practice the mystical form of Islam. Uh, I read ancient city ruins in the desert landscape. And as I read about this region, I thought, wow, this is this would give me the ability to continue the work that I've been making in North Africa. So I felt that visually going out west, I could continue the work that I was making. It would be a different country and a different landscape, but there were, was a lot of similarity. I had the choice to go to the Great Wall or to go to other parts of China, but I just, I just intuitively knew that creatively going west was the right thing for me to do. So I made that decision and um, everyone thought I was crazy <laughs> in Beijing because you couldn't really go further. They thought, why would you go there? And uh, the people that were working on the film that were from China just said, it's hot, it's dangerous, it's, it's not China, why would you go there? And um, I just kind of ignored everyone and uh, bought a train ticket and took a three and a half day train out out west and uh, I think that I knew there was something I was supposed to do and so when I went out west I just kept going deeper and deeper into this trip and I needed to get to the desert and so getting to the desert was a whole you know difficult thing to arrange because you in China as like in Morocco you can rent a car so you can just go do your thing but in China, as a foreigner, you're not allowed to rent a car. So you can't like go off and do your own thing. You have to kind of make all these arrangements. And as an artist, I didn't think, I'll hire a driver, or I'll do it, you know. I just was going to do it. And then I found out I can't just do it. Because you can't say to like a bus driver, stop the bus, <laughs> I need to, you know, make a photograph. So it was, it was, it was like an unbelievable trip. But my driver was Hui. And the Hui are a Chinese Muslim. The Uyghurs are Turkic Muslim. And my Hui driver, we had no language in common, but he, he saw where I was asking him to stop. And he eventually, I guess he was sensitive enough to my vision that he brought me to a holy site. He brought me to the edge of the desert and he just pointed, like, walk in. Like just go that way. And you could see it was sort of worn out a little bit. Other people had walked that path before. And I followed the path into the desert. And eventually I came to this whole, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was a holy site. But I started seeing these flags and these wooden cribs and animal heads. And I thought, now I know I am here. <laughs>